Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship. Thanks, Jeannie. She was playing. She was going to stop. Then I left. She had to keep playing. It's good. There's a lot of moving parts tonight for worship, so bear with us, but it will be fun and meaningful. Maundy Thursday is one of the most important days of our church life and of Holy Week. Um, Many churches wash feet on Monday, Thursday. We have made it a tradition to share First Communion with some of our younger partners in mission. So in homage to the washing feet, some of us go barefoot. If you've clipped your toenails and had your pedicure, you might want to take your shoes off and um, participate in that way, but you don't have to. Augie's thinking about it. Oh, you can come up and take your place. Oh, you could take yours off easily. So um, welcome to this meaningful part of our life together at Cross of Grace and a meaningful part of our holy... It will be. Um, Meaningful part of our life together as Christian people in the world. Kids are helping make it all happen tonight. So let us begin as we do in the name of God the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight we receive a new covenant through Jesus Christ. With broken bread and a shared cup, we celebrate a holy promise. This is a night of remembrance and celebration. It is also a time of fear and betrayal. Around the table with Christ, we receive a new commandment. We are called to love one another as Christ has first loved us. We are disciples of Jesus who share the grace of God through humility and In thanks to God, we become servants to others. By Jesus' example, we become washers of feet. We have come to learn from Jesus Christ. We are open to following where he is. Which you can find red hymnals in front of you.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son established a new covenant for all people, and in the washing of feet, he showed us the dignity of service. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these signs of our life in faith will speak again to our hearts, feed our spirits, and refresh our bodies through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins guarded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. A blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Here ends the reading. For I... The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Beautiful. Stand if you're up for it for the reading of the gospel. It's a little long, but that's your warning, I suppose. From John, the 13th chapter. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. 
He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he'd washed their feet and put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've set you an example that also you also should do as I have done to you. And he said, very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he'd gone out, Judas, that is, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you another commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We will get serious again in a minute. We'll get really serious a little bit later. But first, here is a little something for the kids and also maybe for anyone about my age who remembers Schoolhouse Rock. Can you see it? Mine is bones, you're just a blow. Being frameworks, their main job. to hold them safe and sound inside for you. Your heart and lungs are tucked away and they're behind your ribs. Those bones have been protecting them since we were little kids. Look out! Here comes a bonehead plane. Burn his brain. Tweet, tweet, tweet. What a day! Don't take much to overwhelm it. But luckily, those Bones up there work like a built-in helmet. Shin bone connected to the knee bone. That means the tibia connects to the patella. Knee bone connected to the thigh bone. That means the patella connects to the femur. And here's how they really fit together. Ligaments are what link bone to bone. Cartilage that cushions in between. So here's what's happening in your knees most every time you bend them. That was for my dad, too, because that kid was wearing a Reds shirt. <laughs> so that weird, cheesy little blast from the past came to mind when I learned a thing a couple of weeks ago about a doctor. His name's... Jonathan Reisman, and he's written a new book called The Unseen Body. Each chapter of this book is about a specific body part or body fluid. Yeah. 
and everything that that particular body part or body fluid might have to tell us about ourselves, our health, our bodies, and their function and purpose. So as you might imagine, there's a chapter on the heart, there's a chapter on the brain, there's a chapter on the liver, there's a chapter on the lungs, and so on. And as you might not like to imagine, there are also chapters on blood and urine and feces, too. As part of his research and as part of his lived experience as a doctor, really, as someone who found great respect and reverence for the human body on the very first day that he started dissecting his cadaver in medical school, Dr. Reisman also credits his medical studies and his career as a physician for turning him into a foodie of all things. Someone with a fascination with and a penchant for discovering more about food and drink. He says that when he started learning about which muscles in the human body corresponded to which cuts of beef he was eating, he wanted to know more about that. So not only did he do some research, by the way, of slaughterhouses and butchers, but that led him to start collaborating with a chef on a project that they call Anatomy Eats, where they gather people for dinner, and he and the chef teach and they talk about and they explain to the guests what it is exactly that they are eating. Each dinner has a theme. The cardiovascular system, for instance, where they serve three species of heart prepared in three very different ways. They serve things like blood cookies on cardiovascular night and blood sausage, too. I know enough about blood sausage to know that I want nothing to do with the blood cookie, whatever that is. And as part of such a meal, before or during dinner, I'm not sure which, the doctor dissects the heart in front of the dinner guests, showing them the arteries and the veins and the valves and how it all works and what makes it healthy and what causes it disease and so on. Bon appetit. <laughs> now, despite the fact that I don't eat mammals or birds, as some of you know, I have zero judgment about any of this. I actually give Dr. Reisman and anyone who dares to attend one of these Anatomy Eats dinners some credit for wanting to know that much about whatever it is they're having for dinner. Oddly enough, it all made me think about Jesus. Some of you aren't surprised by that. And his Last Supper. And what in the world those first disciples must have been thinking when he invited them over to celebrate the Passover meal, and then when he started breaking bread with them and pouring wine for them and talking to them about eating his body and drinking his blood for crying out loud. I wonder if they felt like they were at some first century version of an anatomy eats dinner party. And they were, in a way. We call Jesus the great physician, after all. And the great physician was teaching them about what it would mean to eat and to drink and to be fed and to be nourished and to be filled up with the body and the blood of the Lamb of God. Now, Jesus didn't dissect any lambs. Blood sausages likely weren't on the menu. But he did show his disciples what his body came to do. Its function and purpose, if you will. When he disrobed at dinner, when he wrapped the towel around himself, 
when he got on his hands and knees to wash the feet of his friends, Jesus modeled for his followers what servanthood looks like. He embodied humility and meekness, generosity, and grace. And then he invited them to do likewise. And he gave them more clues that night, too, about what his blood could accomplish. His was a new covenant, he said, of sacrifice, of mercy, of forgiveness, of sins. His was a cup of goodness to be shared with the whole wide world. It wasn't anything like a science project, but Jesus revealed his heart to them that night, too, in the end. And he invited them to show theirs in return. Just as I have loved you, he told them, you also should love one another. By this kind of love and mercy, with this sort of sacrifice and servanthood, everyone will know that you are my disciples, he told them. If you have this kind of love for one another in the world, they will know that we're in this together. That's what I think this Maundy Thursday, this First Communion, this Last Supper, and this greatest commandment stuff of Holy Week is all about for us. There's so much symbolism, so much emotion, so much ritual and tradition surrounding what we're here for tonight. And I think it's hard to wrap our heads and our hearts around it all, really. It's hard to swallow, as it were, the fullness of what this meal and this commandment mean for us. And I'm not talking about the gross factor in this. I'm talking about the grace factor here. That God would take on flesh, I mean, and take up a cross and give his life for the sake of the world and then ask us to do the same. That God would stoop to serve humbly, to give generously, to suffer sacrificially and ask us to do the same. That God would love people so deeply without condition, with no strings attached, without any promised return on the investment and command us to do that too. So we eat, so we drink, so we remember, so we give thanks, and so we hope tonight. We hope that the saying is true, that you are what you eat in some way. And that this meal fills us with the same deep love, with the same wide forgiveness, with the same faith that even though we die, we will live. Connected, one to another, bound together by the grace of God in Jesus, crucified, risen for the sake of the world. Amen. Please stand if you are able. And if you follow along in your bulletin, we will continue with our confession and forgiveness. Turning to God and trusting in God's love for us, we confess our sins. God of Adam and Eve, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Mary and Joseph, despite so many faithful examples, we deny what it costs at times to follow Jesus. We don't want to risk our lives or sacrifice our advantages. There are people we don't want to love and places we don't want to go. Still, we are drawn to Jesus and we want to be faithful disciples. Remove the guilt of our sins Fill us with your grace through the bread and wine, the body and blood of our salvation 
in Jesus Christ. Amen. The God who created all things continues to create and to recreate for every one of us. Through Jesus, our God comes to save and to forgive us in his life, death, and resurrection, new life, new joy, and new hope are ours. Know then, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, your sins have been forgiven, and you are made a holy and blessed people. Amen. Please be seated. Let us give and receive our offering. and let us pray. Not yet. God of every good and gracious thing, we give you thanks for calling us together, for blessing us with food and drink, for letting us depart from our holy nature. We use these gifts, this food, and our fellowship to strengthen us the Passover meal recalls Israel's great day of independence, their escape from slavery and death in Egypt. The Lord's Supper recalls our being set free from the power of sin and death. In the Passover meal, the Jewish, the Jewish believer receives identity and gains hope for the future. In the Lord's Supper, we recall our adoption into God's family and renew our hope that nothing can separate us from God's love. We gather tonight for a meal and for fellowship, for word and for prayers that remind us of the last moments of Jesus' life. As we prepare for the office of days ahead, we share food, drink, and story, remembering God's presence with us and seeking strength from the community. Since this is a table of celebration at the moment, it's worth saying happy birthday to Jeannie. She's celebrating like her 39th birthday today, I think, right? <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious and mighty God, we give you thanks for the strange holy ways you call us together as your people. We give you thanks tonight for the gift of bread and wine, for the blessing of body and blood, for the call to be servants for the command to love. We ask that you use this meal to fill us up, to draw us together, to give us great courage and deep faith enough to follow your lead. So as we gather here now, we remember this night long ago when Jesus gathered with his disciples, when he took bread and broke it, gave thanks and gave it for his disciples to eat and said, take this and eat it. This is my body and it's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Then again, after supper, Jesus took a cup. He blessed it, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for each and every one of them to drink. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. So we eat, we drink, we remember, we celebrate, and again, and yet, we hope that this body and that this blood will transform our lives so that we might change the world with the love you have already shared with us. Remember us kindly, Lord. Make us your servants and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Communion will take place, like everything else tonight, a little bit differently. Our first communion families are going to come up first in two shifts. Can I get the first four families to start making their way up here while I continue talking? Um, so after we commune the kids and their families around the altar, then um, you, the ushers will lead whoever's left out there forward to receive bread and wine. All are welcome to this table at Cross of Grace, so please... Um, Respond to that invitation if you are at all inclined or curious. Um, we hope that you will. You'll walk by first a piece of bread, and then you will walk by a tray that has both red wine around the outside of each tray and white grape juice in the center, and you may help yourself to whichever you prefer. Thank you. 
Christ is the bread of 
please stand if you are able one more time. Before we get really serious again, let's just acknowledge and give thanks for how great the communion bread was tonight because the kids made it right before church with the help of Grandma Ammerman. Now, be filled with love and by Christ's command to share it. In the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We are going to continue now with our stripping of the altar, quietly, meditatively. First, I need the First Communion kids to come up and do their thing with their chalices. You're gonna, we're going to take those off first and put them back in the sacristy. Don't be shy. I said slowly and carefully, but I didn't mean like, Mother, may I? <laughs> there you go.
go in peace, waiting and watching for the good news that is ours in Jesus Christ. Amen.